Hello and welcome to this Foster Care Institute online training webinar. Mental Health Issues and Youth in Foster Care. I'm your host, Dr. John DeGarmo, founder and director of the Foster Care Institute. I'm an author of several best-selling foster care books, an international speaker and trainer, and have been a foster parent myself to over 60 plus children who have come to live in my home and been a part of my family. Indeed, over the years, my wife and I have cared for many youth who have suffered from a variety of mental health issues. Our goal during this webinar is to increase your awareness of the issues of mental health for youth in foster care. Not only are we going to help you increase your awareness of mental health challenges and how it impacts all of our lives, we're also going to give you some tips and some strategies designed to help you help youth who suffer from mental health issues. To be sure, there has been a rise in mental health issues amongst teens, not only in foster care, but in all of society the last several years. In fact, I would state to you that the real pandemic right now is mental health. We are in the midst of a mental health crisis for today's teenagers. Now, let's look at some statistics surrounding the mental health crisis. According to some studies, approximately 80% of youth in the foster care system have some sort of of mental health challenge. Now, within the general population, general society, those youth who are coming from and living in stable homes and are coming from traditional families, these youth see approximately 20% of mental health challenges. So you can see the difference there. Youth who come from traditional homes have about a 20% chance of gaining mental health challenges, while those youth in foster care have about an 80% risk. 80% of youth in foster care have mental health challenges, while 20% of youth coming from traditional homes suffer from mental health challenges. So the difference is rather stark. More statistics, 44% of teens state that they feel sad, they feel depressed since the lockdowns of 2020 and 2021. During the time that we locked ourselves into our homes during COVID. Now, during that self same time, during that time of the lockdowns of 2020 and 2021, more than one third of students said that they experienced racism during that time as well. What should be very disturbing is this statistic. Suicide attempts in young girls are up almost 70% since the lockdowns of 2020 and 2021. Let me state that one again because this is a startling statistic. Once more, suicide attempts in young teenage girls is up almost 70% since the lockdowns of 2020 and 2021. Finally, roughly 5 million children in the United States experience domestic violence in their home every single year. Now consider this. Consider this. Those children, those children, 5 million children, during the lockdowns of 2020 and 2021, when they were no longer going to school, where there was no mandated reporter, no longer going to school, a place where they might get two meals a day, no longer going to school, which might have been their safe space, escaping from domestic violence in their home, what society did instead was lock these children into their homes during the lockdowns, so lock these children with their abuser, again with no mandated reporter. Let's look at some definitions of mental health. 
According to the Mayo Clinic, mental health is this, quote, mental health conditions in children are most often defined as delays or changes in thinking, behaviors, social skills, or control over emotions. These problems distress children. Mental health conditions disrupt their being able to act well at home, in school, or in other social settings. End quote. And once again, thanks to the Mayo Clinic for their definition of mental health. The Center for Disease Control, otherwise known as the CDC, defines mental health as follows. Quote, Mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act. It also helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others, and make healthy choices. Mental health is important at every stage of life, from childhood and adolescence through adulthood. End quote. And again, we thank the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, for their definition of mental health. I think it's important to review what it might be like for a teenager placed into the foster care system, what they might experience. I would like you to imagine a teenager, perhaps a 14-year-old girl, suddenly, without any explanation that she can perceive, she's removed from her home. She's removed from her mother and father, perhaps moved from siblings. She's taken from her bedroom her house, her toys, her pets, her stuffed animals. She's taken from her neighborhood. She's taken from her relatives, aunts, uncles, grandparents, cousins. She's taken from her school, her teachers, her peers, her schoolmates, her friends. She's taken perhaps from church. Everything that she knows, everything that is familiar to her, and placed into a residential facility. Much like the residential facility that you work at. As you can imagine, this is a time of tremendous anxiety. You can put aside all of the abuse, all of the trauma, all of the neglect that she might have experienced in her home and by her friend, her family. And now being placed into this residential home, this is a time of tremendous anxiety. It's a time of uncertainty. It's a time where she asks questions like, why am I here? What did I do wrong? Will I ever see my, my mother and father again? Will these other residents hurt me? Will the staff hurt me? Will the staff treat me well? Will the staff curse and yell and swear at me? Will I ever go home again? Does anybody love me. For some teens, it might be a time of guilt. They might think that they were at fault. They might think that they did something wrong. Please allow me to share a personal experience with you. My wife and I had placed into our home a sibling group of five, five brothers and sisters. The teenager, the oldest one, the 14-year-old one, felt tremendous guilt. Their home, according to the three deputies and the two caseworkers that worked the case, told my wife and I that their house had no electricity, no running water, no food, no plumbing, no heat, no air, no water. We were told that the floor was completely covered by human and dog feces. According to the three deputies and the two caseworkers, you could not place your hand on any countertop because they were covered in human and dog feces. When they arrived at our home, their clothes were stapled together, and we had to burn the clothing because the clothing was contaminated by not only feces, but also by meth, as the mother was running a meth lab in the home with her two teenage boyfriends. For this teenage boy, 
placed into a foster care environment. He felt tremendous guilt. He felt he let his brothers down. He felt he let his sisters down. He felt he let his mother down. He felt he left his family down because it was his job. It was his responsibility. It was his role, if you will, to ensure, to make sure that his brothers and sisters were fed each morning, that his brothers and sisters were clothed each morning, that his brothers and sisters made it to school each day. It was his role and responsibility to ensure that they had dinner provided. It was his role to look out for the police. It was his role to look after the family finances. Again, you can imagine the guilt he felt and he experienced when he felt he let his family down. For some youth placed in the foster care system, they might be unable to express themselves. They may be so overwhelmed by the feelings and emotions that they're experiencing that they do not know how to process, they do not understand. They're unable to express themselves. For so many youth placed in foster care, these are the experiences that they face. And as you can imagine, it adds not only to their anxiety, but to their mental health and well-being. Now, let's look at some of the mental health issues facing youth in foster care today. To begin with, there's often confusion. Youth place into a residential foster care facility. They may not understand. They may not comprehend why they have been placed into yet another home, into a residential home or facility. For you see, confusion abounds. Some teenagers might see it as an illogical move or an irrational move. Some teens might blame themselves, thinking, again, that it was their fault that they were placed into the home. That it was their fault that they were removed from their family. That it was their fault that their mother, their father, their parents kicked them out of the house, so to speak. Some teens feel that they are no longer loved, that nobody loves them. And still other teens might feel that they have been abandoned. Again, let me share another story with you, please. My wife and I had a phone call for a 17-year-old teenage boy. He had been moving from home to home to home with his mother as she went from various boyfriend to boyfriend. The teenage boy was on nine psychotropic drugs, mainly to sedate him and keep him quiet. As you know, many teens in the foster care system are over-medicated with psychotropic drugs. The boyfriend of one month said to the mother, Make a choice. Make a decision. It's either me or your son. As you can imagine, the mother chose the boyfriend. She helped her son an hour later pack his bag, hit the road, so to speak, and he found his way to jail. The sheriff, who is a dear friend of our family, called us up and said to us, We have a 17-year-old boy in jail. He should not be here. We cannot keep him here. No one's coming to visit him. No one's calling upon him. He has no place to go. Will you take him? We did indeed take him. And as you can imagine, there were many mental health issues facing him and that he struggled with. He felt abandoned. The National Children's Traumatic Stress Network defines traumatic stress as, quote, the physical and emotional responses of a child to events that threaten the life or physical integrity of the child or someone critically important to the child. End quote. Again, we thank the National Children's Traumatic Stress Network for their definition of traumatic stress. Now, let's look at some of the traumatic experiences that youth in foster care might experience as they're placed into a foster care facility. Why might they be placed into such a facility that you work at? It might be due to prolonged separation or perhaps death of a family member. 
Perhaps a teen has experienced various forms of abuse, or they may have witnessed abuse to others in their home. Some teens might come to your residential facility due to homelessness. There might be drugs or alcohol in the family. They might have experienced great neglect. They may have experienced abandonment, or perhaps their family members have been imprisoned. Now, each time a teen is placed into yet another home, another residency, another facility, it's known as multiple displacement. And as they experience these placement disruptions, there are bound to be emotional, social, and psychological effects. Indeed, as they go from one home to the next, their mental health will be threatened. Their academic performances are often lower than traditional students. And these teens, as they go from one place to the next, from one living environment to the next, from one home to the next, from one facility to the next, they experience issues of trust and attachment. Indeed, some of the most common issues they experience are anxiety and depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Did you know that teens in foster care experience PTSD at twice the rate of our U.S. war veterans? Now, why do we as a society not address this? We address it with our U.S. war veterans, and rightfully so. But we don't address this in society because society in general does not focus on foster care. In addition, teens bouncing from home to home, so to speak, often experience eating disorders and, as we stated earlier, issues of trust and attachment. For much more on this, watch the Anxiety and Disorders training webinar at the Foster Care Institute. So what do some of the signs and symptoms look like for youth who experience mental health issues? Let's look at some of those symptoms and signs. To begin with, those youth who are placed into a residential facility and have mental health issues, they may avoid things that might trigger further anxiety. This might be sitting around at a table for meals, socializing with others, engaging in social activities, taking part in chores, etc. They might be restless or very, very tense. Teens who experience mental health issues might have issues of depression. Their diet might change. They might feel tense. They might have feelings of nervousness, and they may be overly stressed. Other symptoms include stomach ache or gastrointestinal problems. They may have higher rate higher heart rate than expected at that age group. They may experience hyperventilation or they are breathing quickly. Teens who experience mental health challenges might also be hypervigilant. They may experience suicidal thoughts. They may have sw overly sweating. They may have trouble sleeping. They may be unable to control any worrying thoughts that they have. Other symptoms include mood swings. They may experience tremendous mood swings. In one moment, they are feeling happy. In another moment, they may be feeling confused or angry or sad. They may overdose on drugs or alcohol. Teens who experience mental health issues often have pro prolonged sadness. They experience school-related issues. Again, they may have trouble sleeping and they're unable to control the worrying thoughts and emotions that overwhelm them. Now, let's again look at post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, is an anxiety disorder occurring after someone has experienced or witnessed an extreme traumatic event. The teen feels overwhelming fear, terror, or helplessness. Teens who experience mental health issues may have feelings of avoidance as well. They may try to avoid any thought, any feeling, any memory associated with a past 
or prior traumatic event, a traumatic event they may have experienced before being placed into the residential facility. They may try to avoid activities, people, places that arouse or bring back these memories of that traumatic event. They may have loss of interest in any sort of activities. They might not want to participate in the activities that go on in the residential home, sports activities, activities at school. They may be detached or estranged from others. They may not want to interact with other teens and residents of the facility. They may wish to avoid interacting with staff members and supervisors and therapists and counselors. And finally, they may try to avoid any sort of loving feeling. And they might not see any sort of future for them as well. Many teens in the foster care system experience something known as separation anxiety, a mental health issue, to be sure. The more a teen is moved from one place to the next, from one home to the next, from one residential facility to the next, and from one school to school, well, the more the anxiety will increase. Indeed, separation from fam family and from friends creates this sort of anxiety. Those teens that undergo multiple displacement are likely to find it very challenging and very difficult to form any sort of relationship. Relationships with their fellow residents or teens, re relationships with people at school, relationships with adults, with caseworkers, with staff members. And indeed, these teens who experience separation anxiety often place walls, if you will, in front of them to separate themselves from the pain they are experiencing. Now, when it comes to treating youth in the foster care system who experience mental health challenges, there's often barriers to treating them. Indeed, those youth who have experienced multiple displacements, it's very difficult to help them with their mental health challenges because, again, of lack of attachment and lack of trust. And then also aging out of the foster care system and not getting any help beforehand is often a barrier to treating youth who experience mental health challenges. As they age out, they often don't get the help that they need. And finally, when they do transition out of the foster care system or during the process, there's often a lack of support services for these youth in the foster care system who are struggling with mental health. Now, it is important to remember this. How each teenager reacts to mental health is going to be different. Again, how each teenager reacts to the mental health challenges that they are experiencing and struggling with and facing, it's going to be different for each teen. When it comes to diagnosis of mental health, a teen's healthcare professional might suggest that he sees some sort of mental health specialist. This specialist could be a psychiatrist or a psychologist, a clinical social worker, a psychiatric nurse practitioner, or any other mental health care professional. These professionals can help with diagnosis by doing the following. Professionals might complete a medical exam on the teenager. They might look into and examine the family history of physical and mental illness. They're trying to see if there is a history in the family of mental health problems. They're also going to look at a history of physical or emotional trauma within the family itself. Professionals might diagnose a problem by looking at the medical history of the teen. Oftentimes, there's a number of mental health tests and questionnaires for the teen as well as for his biological family members, if available. 
Professionals might review the symptoms and concerns with the birth parents. They also might look at the school history to see if there's a pattern of behavioral problems or academic problems the teen might be experiencing. Professionals will often talk with the teen and watch the teen's behavior. Those teens who struggle with mental health might have professionals talk with their birth parents about any history, and they might look at a timeline of how the teen has matured, or perhaps lack of maturity. Professionals often diagnose mental health issues in youth, but this can take time. It's not something that happens quickly or suddenly or even in a few days. It can take sometimes several weeks or months to do so. It's important to remember this as a professional is trying to work with a teen to determine if there's a mental health problem. Some teens may have trouble knowing or saying how they feel. They struggle, they struggle trying to express the emotions they're feeling. And as you can imagine, how a teenager matures is certainly going to vary. Finally, a healthcare professional might change or adjust a mental health diagnosis over a period of time. Thanks to the Mayo Clinic for these diagnoses. So, how do we help teens who are struggling with mental health? Teens in the foster care system who are struggling with mental health that you work with each day, how can we help them? Well, to begin with, it's so important that we do not take their behavior personally. Remember, they are struggling with mental health. As a result, they might say things to you, about you, or about others that's not kind, that's not pleasant. In fact, that might be negative, harsh, critical, destructive. They might physically do things to you or to others. Again, it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with a teen who is in the midst of a mental health crisis. So once again, when that teenager says something to you or about you, who screams at you, who uses profanity to you, who is defiant, has nothing to do with you as a staff member or as a person. Has everything to do with the teen who is struggling with mental health. Those teens who are struggling with mental health, safety is a priority. They must feel safe. So you need to ensure that they are safe. Now, indeed, they are safe at the residential facility, but do they feel safe? You need to ensure them and remind them that he is safe morning, noon, and night. When he wakes up, when he comes home from school or work, and when he goes to bed. Now, it's important for us to recognize that he could be triggered by things that we don't expect, by noises, by nighttime, by darkness, or again, other ways that are unexpected. So it is important that you ensure him every day, throughout the day, in a consistent fashion, that he is safe. When he feels safe, he can begin to heal from whatever he's struggling with. When you have an understanding of trauma-related needs, it helps you to better understand what he's experiencing. So learn, understand how not only he, the teenager, but also how his family has been impacted by trauma and traumatic events. Because when you have an understanding, you're going to be able to better help him. Because you have insight into what he has or he's currently struggling with. Find some services for him that are based on his unique circumstances. You might ask your supervisor. You might ask a professional therapist or counselor or a professional mental health advocate. And always use language-appropriate conversations. As we noted earlier, how a teenager matures varies from one teenager to the next. So how you speak to one teenager could be very, very different to how you speak to another teenager. Remember, simply because a teenager is 17 years of age might not mean he has the maturity level of a 17-year-old. He could be mature-wise much younger. 
And a 13 or 14 year old teenager might be much older, maturity wise, because of the things he's experienced. So again, when you have a conversation with a teen, make sure that your language is appropriate to that particular person. Teens learn about mental health from you, from you, their caretakers and the adults in their lives. They're watching you, they're listening to you, they're learning about mental health, good mental health. Again, I emphasize the word good mental health. They learn about good mental health from the adults in their life, including you. So with that in mind, it is so important that you model good mental health at all times, at all times in front of them, even when you are struggling, even when you are not feeling the best, even when you're having a bad day, you need to model good mental health in front of him at all times. Now, it is okay for you to share with him that you might be struggling, that you might be having a bad day, that you might be feeling a little bit down, but you also let him know what you are going to do about it to feel better. The steps that you are going to take in order to feel better. So you let him know that, yes, I'm struggling, but this is what I'm going to do about it. Yes, I'm having a bad day, but I'm not going to let me affect me because I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Remember, he's watching you, he's listening to you at all times, and he's learning about good mental health from you. So many teens in the foster care system have issues of trust and attachment. So it's critical for you that you help to form a healthy, positive relationship. Indeed, it is necessary for every single teenager to form a healthy relationship with at least one main adult figure or a caretaker in their life in order to develop both socially and emotionally. So begin to build trust with him by creating safe spaces. And talk to your supervisor about safe spaces within the residential facility. So not only can he form healthy relationships with you, but with other adults in his life, perhaps other caregivers, maybe previous foster parents, maybe a caseworker or a CASA, maybe a mental health therapist, teachers, juvenile judges, or maybe members of a church. Now one way to help mental health is by getting enough sleep. So many studies indicate that teenagers need more sleep at that age group than at any other time in their life. So you can help them by helping develop healthy habits, not only including sleep, but also through diet. Eating regular, nutritious meals with fresh fruits and veggies, whole grains, lean protein, limit processed foods such as junk food, and energy drinks and sodas. Other healthy habits including exercising every day or playing every day, moving around every day. Attending regular health care checkups is one way to check up on his mental health. And finally, so many teens today struggle through mental health issues because of the amount of time they spend in front of a screen, in front of a phone, a laptop, a tablet, etc. Now this could be a battle. This could be a battle, but it is so important that you limit his screen time. There are so many studies that correlate the number or the amount of screen time spent by a teen in alignment with mental health issues. So again, limit the screen time. He may resist this, he might fight this, but this is so important. He needs your help. He needs you to be there to listen when he's struggling, when he's depressed, when he's angry, when he's just feeling down. And he is ready to talk about it with somebody. And he approaches you. You need to stop what you're doing. You put the phone down. You put the paperwork aside. You turn off the laptop. You stop the chores or responsibilities that you are doing. And you sit down and you listen. You don't offer suggestions, you are there to listen. Now, you do not overreact, you're not critical of him, 
you're listening to him. Check out our webinar here at Emphatic Listening on how you can develop some great listening skills. Make sure you nurture and comfort him in an appropriate manner. In an appropriate manner. So no false accusations or false allegations are made. If you're unsure what this looks like, ask your supervisor what this might be. Again, provide consistent structure each day with meals, with playtime, with chores, with homework, etc. Because when he has a consistent structure, when he knows what to expect each day, throughout the day, this helps with his anxiety level. Because there's no surprises. He has structure. He knows what to expect. He knows that in the morning he wakes up, there are certain things he has to do to get ready to go to school. He knows that after school there might be certain chores, or responsibilities, or homework. He knows when meal time is. He knows when play time is. He knows when, when uh, bedtime is. And that's structured and consistent. Again, when there is structure, it takes away much of his anxiety. Now, to be sure, there might be times when you need to be flexible when it comes to a daily routine and a daily structure, a daily schedule. Perhaps there's a special movie, a birthday party, a special event. So you can also in include flexibility, of course, as well. Most likely, that teenager that's in the foster care residential facility that you work at and you work with and care for, he's craving words of praise. He's craving words of encouragement. He might come from an environment where there was never any sort of praise or encouragement. And he needs it. We all feel good. We all feel much better when somebody praises us. When someone tells us, job well done. When someone tells us, thank you so much for doing this. He needs that as well. So look for ways each day and throughout the day to encourage him and to praise him. And there's a great list right there of 25 ways to encourage. Now there are some sorts of treatment that you can do in the home, in the residential facility that can help him. These include play therapy, going outside and playing basketball, or walking, riding a bike, swimming, music therapy, working with guitars or drums, or even something as simple as a harmonica can be very therapeutical as they express themselves through music. Same thing with art, coloring, sculptures, drawing, painting. These can be very therapeutical as the teen expresses himself through art. And finally, animal therapy, whether it is a dog or a cat or chickens or whatever it might be. Caring for animals can also be very therapeutical, particularly if the teen is sitting down and petting the animal. As he pets the animal and expresses himself and talks to that animal, the animal does not talk back. The animal is not judgmental. The animal is not critical. The animal simply listens and perhaps cuddles into the person. And there's a great deal of healing to the simple act of petting. Group therapy might be something you could consider, or group support systems. And finally, there is medication. Now, medication does not, of course, fix all the problems. It might help, but it does not fix all of the issues. Any time you use any sort of medication, you must not only get permission from the supervisor, you must also properly document as well. If you're unsure what this looks like, ask your supervisor. You can also help him by looking out and identifying any sort of triggers that might trigger his trauma, his anxiety. Look for patterns in the teen that lead up to him having a mental health issue. Be emotionally and physically available to him when he's struggling during this time and remind him that it's normal. It is normal to have many of these feelings and many of these anxieties. Never tell him that he's a bad person for feeling this way. Never tell him he's a bad person for having these anxieties. Instead, let him know 
that it's okay to feel this way and it's normal to have some of these feelings and anxieties. Now to be sure, he's struggling. So be reasonable and realistic with your expectations. Don't expect professional treatment, professional therapy to quickly fix or resolve all of the issues. It takes time. In addition, don't expect that simply loving the teen is going to be the quick fix to his mental health challenges, to his mental health issues. He does need love. He also needs professional help and he needs time. And allow the teen to be a teenager. Remember, some of these teens are coming to the facility who have never had the opportunity to truly be a teenager. Allow him, encourage him to play, to do art, to listen to music or maybe create his own music, to discover new skills and interests, hobbies, maybe some skills and interests and hobbies that could lead to a, a possible career down the line. Ask him to help you with cooking. Ask him to help you with cleaning up the facility. Ask him to help you with doing laundry. Ask him to help you with some of the chores around the facility. Encourage him to use his imagination. And tell him it's okay to go outside and get a little bit dirty. To get outside and jump in those mud puddles when it's raining and laugh. Laughter can be therapeutic. Again, medications can be used to treat behavioral concerns, but the real work the real healing is done through various forms of therapy. Always, always consult with a doctor and your supervisor before giving the teen any, and I mean any sort, of medication, including Tylenol or pain reliever. When it comes to counseling, we mentioned professional counseling and therapy can also be very, very critical and essential for those teens struggling with mental health therapy. And he might even need some group or family counseling as well. Psychotherapy is a form of therapy, also known as talk therapy or behavior therapy, that involves talking to the psychologist or other mental health professional. With young children and teens, psychotherapy might include playtime or games. During this psychotherapy session, teens might learn how to talk about and manage their thoughts, their emotions, their feelings. Indeed, they often learn new behaviors and coping skills that they need, not only now, but in the future, as they struggle with mental health. It's okay for you to ask for help. Ask your teen's mental health counselor for advice on how to best respond to him, how to best respond to that teenager and his challenging behavior. Indeed, I encourage you to enroll in training programs designed for caretakers such as yourself for teens with mental health illness. And as we mentioned, documentation, document any and all behavior that you believe might have been affected by mental health issues. And you share this documentation with a caseworker, with your professional counselor, with a supervisor. They might have questions and you can document and have the information available to them when they're seeking more knowledge. Finally, my friend, finally remember, remember this, caring for a teen with mental health issues can be exhausting on every level, physically, emotionally, socially, psychologically. You have to practice self-care. Practice self-care so you do not suffer from the very real issue of compassion fatigue or secondary traumatic stress. You are at risk of compassion fatigue. Think about that word. I love that word. Fatigue exhaustion from compassion from caring exhaustion from caring for teens in crisis so practice self care if you don't care for yourself you can't care for the teens who have mental health issues 
need a little bit of inspiration, encouragement, check out the little book of foster care wisdom. We have many books available here at the Foster Care Institute. I'm sure there's a book right now that will help you better understand and better help teens in crisis. For much more, visit our website, drjohndegarmofostercare.com or the Foster Care Institute for webinars, articles, videos, podcasts, and so much more that will help you and empower you to care for teens in crisis. Follow me on Facebook at Dr. John DeGarmo and Twitter. If you have questions about this, simply email me at drjohndegarmo at gmail.com. Hey, thank you so much for taking time to watch this webinar. But more importantly, thank you for making the sacrifices, for making the time, for doing all that you do to care for teens in crisis. Remember, he's watching you. He's learning from you. And he's being helped by all that you do. Once more, we are in the midst of a mental health crisis. The real pandemic is mental health. And it's people like you who are truly making a positive difference. For the Foster Care Institute, I'm Dr. John DeGarmo. Thanks so much.